Welcome to the Workflow Podcast. If you enjoy this show, please like, share, and or subscribe. And now, on with the show. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Workflow Podcast for Season 3. Now, Season 3 is going to be all about how to optimize your personal productivity and effectiveness. And initially, we're going to look at the state of flow, uh, which you might might also know as deep work or the zone. We're then going to get into the myriad ways people sabotage their time at work today. And then finally, we'll be getting into the various tools, techniques, uh, and so on that you can apply to spend more time in the flow state at work, to spend less time being distracted, and to ultimately get more out of each and every single day you're sitting behind your computer or maybe sitting by your scrapbook or maybe sitting by your exercise book writing, whatever it is you happen to do. But whenever you're doing that, we want to ensure that you are completely immersed in the task at hand and not distracted and not sabotaging your best efforts and not sabotaging your ability to do great work. So let's get into this. Now you've probably heard about the flow state, perhaps you've read about it, perhaps you know something about it or know a lot about it, but I'm going to assume you know absolutely nothing about it. So nobody is left behind. Now the flow state was initially coined by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi back in 1975. And uh, I'm pretty happy with that pronunciation, I have to say, because if you're on the YouTube you can have a look at the actual surname. It is definitely not one for the faint-hearted, particularly when it comes to spelling bees. I'd love to see that in a spelling bee, some six-year-old kid. Hey, hey, to- hey, Toby, spell chicks Um, Can you use it in a word, please? Uh, yeah, Mihai chicks coined the term flow back in 1975. Uh, okay, uh, that, w- that would go down really well. <laughs> Fortunately, I don't think names, uh, or at least names of people, uh, feature in spelling bees. So you'll be okay, Toby. Um, So Mihai Csikszentmihalyi coined this term back in 1975. And he found that it was not just a psychological state, but a physiological state as well. And the flow state, the way I like to define it, or at least the definition that I have run with is... Being completely immersed in the task at hand while the rest of the world seems to just fade away and cease to exist. So you can find flow writing. Uh, You could potentially be sitting there writing an article or something to that effect and two hours will go by and it seemed like five minutes. Um, You know, the the rest of the world just ceased to exist during that time because you were totally immersed in what you were doing. Uh, You can find flow uh, surfing. You know, when you're surfing, when you're trying to catch a wave, like you are totally immersed in that activity. Like you're paddling, you're looking over your shoulder at the wave about to break and hopefully you're uh, in the right position to pop up and ride the, the, the face of that wave. Um, but of course, in that moment, you're not thinking about what bills you have to pay. You're not thinking about, say, an argument you may have had with someone. You are completely immersed in the task at hand and that's what gets the very best out of us. Now, interestingly, McKinsey ran a 10-year study where they uh, surveyed and observed corporate executives, and they found that said executives were about five times more productive when they were in the flow state, which is absolutely huge. Now, when we look at how people spend their time at work today, they spend very little time in flow. Because our days are full of meetings, of distractions, of Slack messages, of emails, of Zoom calls, and on and on and on. And people are actually lucky to spend a single hour in flow. But if we can get better at tapping the flow state, then we will essentially be able to outperform our peers, our colleagues in so many ways. And and. If you're listening to this, you're probably thinking, well, how does this relate to uh, what you were talking about in season one, which was all about strengths alignment, passion, uh, purpose, 
you know, when you have those things, it is so much easier to get into flow. I mean, if I'm working on something that I am good at, or at least good at, but also challenged, then I'm going to get into flow. But if I'm working on something that I completely suck at, well, it's going to be pretty hard for me to tap that space where I feel totally immersed in the task at hand. In fact, I'm probably going to feel really frustrated and that's going to set me back and it's going to make it really hard for me to get into a space of deep work. Um, but we'll touch on that a little bit more in this episode and we'll also uh, look at the myriad ways people do sabotage their time in subsequent episodes of season three. So the flow state, as Mihai Csikszentmihalyi said, it is essentially not just a psychological theory, but it is a physiological fact. You know, when what essentially what they did was they would um, hook people's brains up to uh, EEG scanners, I believe, um, but essentially brainwave scanners, um, while people were doing different types of activities. And they found that when people were in flow, uh, they essentially uh, arrived at a space between or at the intersection of the alpha and the theta brainwaves. So what are they? Well, there are five key brainwaves. The first one is delta, which is similar to, say, what you experience in deep, dreamless sleep. The second is alpha, uh, which is dominant during, say, quiet thought, while you're daydreaming, while you're doing some light meditation. The third one is beta, which is associated with normal waking consciousness. The fourth one is theta, which is about intuition and processing information above and beyond normal consciousness. And the fifth one is gamma, which is higher processing tasks and cognitive functioning. So when you think about flow, we're at the intersection of alpha, which is, like I said, dominant during daydreaming or light meditation, and theta, which is the process, the, the processing of information above and beyond normal consciousness. So you're kind of in this dreamy state, but you're completely locked into a specific task. And I'm sure you felt that in various um, guises, at, at, at whether it's at work or whether it's outside of work, um, but essentially that is the physiological uh, mechanism behind the flow state. Now, apparently uh, some gamma waves also show up while we are in flow, um, and that is those higher processing tasks and cognitive functioning. Now, if we want to be our best at anything, we really need to be spending more time in flow. Now, the upper limit for flow in, uh, say, the workplace, when it comes to, say, writing an article, when it comes to putting a presentation together, things of that persuasion, it's about four hours a day. Um, but like I said, we typically are lucky to get one hour a day based on how most modern workplaces go about their business. Now... On the four hours a day, um, it's interesting to note people like Charles Darwin, you know, who founded the theory of evolution, worked about five hours a day, and one of those hours was for lunch. Um, so literally four hours a day, he found that his cognition fell off a cliff very quickly thereafter. Uh, a 1980s study, which looked at three groups of scientists uh, working 20 hours, 35 hours, and 60 hours respectively, found that the 20-hour-a-week group was actually twice as productive as the 35-hour-a-week group and interestingly, the 60-hour-a-week group was the least productive um, because when you spend more time on a particular task, you tend to fill your time with stuff that's just not of value. I mean, this is Parkinson's law. If you give someone 10 hours to do something, they'll take 10 hours to do something. If you give them two hours to do something, they'll take two hours to do something. Um, but not only that, if you're not giving your, your brain time to rest, then gradually you're not bringing your best self to the table. You're bringing it a shadow of your best self to the table, regardless of whether you're sitting at your desk for 10, 30, or 50 hours. Um, and also at the Berlin Conservatory of Music, uh, for decades they have given their students just four hours of deliberate practice a day because they found that after four hours, the quality of their practice uh, subsides very, very quickly. Four hours is, as they say, at the Berlin Conservatory of Music, the upper limit for deliberate practice. Now, let's look at how we go about triggering the flow state. So there are a number of different triggers, whether they be psychological triggers, social triggers, um, and other triggers which rely on both environmental factors and external factors. So let's get into some of the psychological triggers first. First one is intense focus. 
So doing away with all of our distractions, doing away with the 17 tabs open on our browser and just focusing on that one task at hand. The second, clear goals. If I know what I'm working towards, if the goal means something to me, remember we talked about incentives in season one, then it's easier to get my butt into gear. But if I don't have a clear goal or direction for my day, my week, my business, my life, well, then it can all kind of seem kind of redundant and devoid of purpose. And as we've discussed previously, when you don't have purpose, it can be really difficult to play the long game. And when you just try and persist on something without purpose, it just becomes a grind. And so having clear goals, goals that actually mean something to you, can definitely help you to get into the flow state, particularly if those goals are are rather short term. So for example, if I'm sitting down to my desk today, one of my goals was to record this episode. It's a clear goal. Um, The purpose of it is to help people get in control of their work days and get more done and also feel more fulfilled by work and not spend 12 12 hours at their desk every day with little to show for it. So there was a clear goal that I wanted to get done today. There's a clear purpose behind it. And so I just sat down at my desk and got started with a Whereas if I was kind of like meandering and not really sure what I was going to be working on today, then I would have very quickly found myself on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Uh, The third psychological trigger, immediate feedback. So I had talked about a surfer a few moments ago or surfing. um, And that's a perfect example whereby if I am riding a wave, you know, in every microsecond on that wave, like I am adjusting based on how my body feels on the board based on what the wave is doing based on my observations there is immediate feedback and that keeps me in flow now the opposite of that might be the way many typical large organizations run where it can take weeks to get feedback on something Um, you know whether it's a piece of work a, a presentation you've put together and if you're not getting feedback in not necessarily real time but in small bursts Well, then you don't know whether you're on the right track. You don't know whether to adjust. You're not getting that positive or negative reinforcement. And you can kind of feel like you're driving blind. So having some form of immediate feedback is absolutely critical. I mean, just sports in general. If I'm playing a game of basketball and my team seems to be losing, well, the immediate feedback is we need to make some changes. And that keeps us locked into the present moment. Um, Again, uh, one thing I touched on earlier is if I'm skilled at something, it's easier to get in flow. If my team is losing by 40 points, I'm probably going to get really frustrated and just give up. So uh, that's something we'll touch on in a second as well with the challenge skills ratio, which is the fourth psychological trigger. So it turns out that, and, and research backs this, it turns out that when we engage on activities that are about 4% beyond our capabilities, You know, it's 4% more challenging than what our skills are capable of doing, say. That is the optimal space for flow because it forces us to reach, to exert ourselves. It's not too difficult. It's not like going to make us frustrated. It's not too easy to the point where we're just bored. It is just beyond our existing capabilities. It forces us to stretch, to learn, to grow. Uh, An example of this or maybe not such a good example of this, could be uh, Michael Jordan suiting up against Muggsy Bogues back in the 90s. So Michael Jordan was, I believe, six foot six. Don't quote me on that. But Muggsy Bogues was five, seven, five, eight. He was, a, he was a short dude. In fact, Michael Jordan called him a midget. But somehow in a Chicago Bulls versus Charlotte Hornets game, there was a mismatch on the court and Jordan ended up facing young little Muggsy Bergs and Bergs was in fact guarding Jordan. So Jordan's just outside of the three point line. He's bouncing the ball. He's looking down at Muggsy Bergs. He's calling him a midget. And somehow Muggsy just puts the pressure on him and actually steals the ball. Now, unfortunately for Muggsy, the ball eventually rolled out of bounds and the Bulls got the ball back, but that's not, that's beside the point. He stole the ball because for Muggsy Bergs, Perhaps he was operating at the edge of his capabilities. He said, okay, yep, you're way taller than me. Yeah, you're just, you happen to be the greatest basketballer of all time, but 
I'm going to back myself. I'm going to stretch myself. I'm going to do what I can in this situation. And he stole the ball. Whereas Jordan was perhaps on the other side of that spectrum saying, look at this midget. He's like two feet shorter than me. What's he going to do? I'm not even going to bother. And perhaps as a result of that, he lost the ball. Um, So there's your psychological triggers. Having intense focus, doing away with those distractions, having clear goals, getting some form of immediate feedback, and finally finding or working at the optimal challenge to skills ratio. Next, environmental triggers. So let's keep the basketball analogy going just because it's an easy one to work with. The first environmental trigger is high consequences. Now, this is where we have elevated risks. Now, the basketball analogy here is we're two points down. Uh, It's the NBA Finals, Game 7. The Phoenix Suns are suiting up against the Milwaukee Bucks. And... DeAndre Aiden is going to pass the ball in to Devin Booker, who is a very talented three-point shooter. Now, there's only two seconds to go in that moment. You've got to be absolutely locked in. You've, you've got to nail that three, or your team loses game seven, and you are not the NBA champions. But if you nail that three, all that work that you've put in over the preceding 10, 20, 30 years, all pays off, and you are now an NBA champion. You can put that ring on your finger. High consequences get us locked in. And the same can be said of work. If I have a deadline approaching and it's an important deadline, that's going to get me locked in. Similarly, when you were in school, perhaps you'd procrastinate about putting an essay together. But as that deadline approached the night before, you would perhaps do 90% of the work. And that's the high consequences getting us to do things to get locked in. Now, the second environmental trigger is also a rich environment. So this is an an environment with lots of novelty, unpredictability, um, and so on. Now, you could perhaps recall when you have traveled to a new city, a new country that you've not been to before, you tend to be a lot more observant of your surroundings. You tend to be really um, tuned in to what's going on around you, noticing street signs, noticing people on the street, noticing... um, landmarks and features in the landscape that's because it's all novel it's all new so rich environments also help to get us into flow Um, and when you apply that to work it could be that you're working on something a little bit different perhaps it's a new project there's a bit of novelty going on and sometimes we can fall victim to that as well because we might get bored of working on a particular thing so let's get some novelty in our lives and start something new but that thing can get bored boring after a while as well so while rich environments Definitely useful to help us get into flow. Sometimes they can um, work against us if we constantly seek out that novelty. And that that also applies in our personal lives too. Um, The other aspect of rich environments that I should probably touch on is just say having to deliver a keynote at a big conference in front of 500 people. You know, it's say it's at some huge convention center and there's all sorts of noise and color and activity going on as you make your way into the convention center there's all sorts of vendors exhibiting uh, there's people all over the place shaking hands meeting each other show bags are being given out and then you're introduced uh, well then you get mic'd up backstage you have your glass of perrier you get introduced to the audience everybody's clapping you walk on stage that is a very rich environment And that's also going to help get you into the flow state, hopefully, so you can deliver a rocking keynote talk. The third group of triggers, social and group triggers. So these are triggers that relate to working with other people. Um, So serious concentration would be the first social trigger. So I mentioned having two seconds on the clock and needing to score that three to become NBA champions. Well, in that situation, the team is really all locked in. They all need to work together. They all need to be 100% present in order to pull off that play, to get the ball in from the perimeter, to make sure it ends up in Devin Booker's hands so he can nail that three. Uh, The second social trigger is shared clear goals, which is, I guess, kind of intuitive. You know, we're all looking to nail that three, and it's not like one person wants to... Uh, nail a two-pointer to send it into overtime. It's not like another person wants to just get fouled or try and get fouled to go to the free throw line. Everybody wants to nail that three and win the game. Third, effective communication. So that's the third social trigger. And this is a really important one because if you think about it from the perspective of work, sometimes what one person says and the way another person interprets it 
can be quite different. And then the other person goes off and works on something and delivers it and says, actually, this isn't what we wanted. Um, so making sure there is effective, clear communication um, is absolutely critical when it comes to helping get people in flow. But also, like if you think about it from the perspective of, say, um, sports, a, a team working together towards a common goal, if it seems like one person didn't quite get the message, then their strategy or their uh, play isn't going to get pulled off the way uh, they, the rest of the team anticipated and that's going to ruin their flow because they're going to start thinking, what the hell is going on here? Um, the fourth social trigger is familiarity. So a common language, shared knowledge base, people are on the same page. The fifth, equal participation and skill level. Again, if you're working in a team and some people are just rock stars while others have a lot of work to do to even become remotely considered a rock star, well, then you're going to find it very difficult to work together. Um, you know, if I am trying to jumpstart a car and I'm pushing from the back, but I need two people to push and the other person is really just leaning on the car and not exerting themselves, well, the car's not going to go anywhere. I'm going to get frustrated and I guess I won't be getting to my destination that day um, unless I really have a stern talking to my friend who is not really pulling their weight, so to speak. Um, and then finally, the fifth social or the sixth social trigger, rather, risk. When we do things that are risky, when there are consequences to our actions, um, when we have skin in the game, whether it's mental, social, physical, and so on, we operate at a high level. I mean, if you've ever played poker for, say, potato chips, the, <laughs> the decisions you make are going to be quite, quite different to the ones you make when you're actually playing for hard-earned cash, particularly if those amounts of cash are what you would consider high. Uh, you know, I've played poker for potato chips in the past and I was just all in on every second hand. I'm like, yeah, screw it, let's go all in. But when I've played for cash, I've definitely been a hell of a lot more reserved um, about my choices at the poker table. And then there are some other triggers you might want to explore. We can call these external triggers because they rely on things outside of us, such as, say, uh, binaural beats. So there are tools you can find like um, brain.fm and my, mynoise.net. Um, which essentially use different audio frequencies. So you have, say you've, you're wearing a pair of headphones, one audio frequency will play in one ear, another audio frequency will play in the other ear, and that will essentially stimulate the flow state. Typically it takes like five to 10 minutes for me, um, but if you're finding it difficult to get into flow and you need some external help listening to these binaural beats or just finding some, say, white noise playlists on Spotify can also be very, very helpful to just get you locked into the moment. Um, similarly, you might try listening to the same song on repeat. Now, this is something that Matt Mullenweg of WordPress does, but also um, Arkansas psychologist Elizabeth Helmuth Margulis echoed these same sentiments in her book, On Repeat, How Music Plays in the Mind. Now, you might want to think twice before cranking Slayer, Slayer's Rain in Blood on repeat all day long. Although, if you love your Slayer, that might just do it for you. So you never know. Um, smart drugs or nootropics or brain enhancers. Um, these are have always been, not always, I won't say always, um, but these have for a long time been quite popular in Silicon Valley amongst the likes of Tim Ferriss and similar personalities. Um, whether it's, you know, on its alpha brain is a, is a good... Uh, nootropic, but there are countless others out there, whether it's lion's mane, chaga mushroom, and so on. Um, and we did touch on a number of these in season two on different things you can do to optimize your body and your mind. Um, but I wouldn't be relying solely on things like smart drugs to help get you into flow. I mean, the smart drug without purpose, without strengths alignment, without consequences, without clear goals, without some form of immediate feedback, it's not really going to get you into flow. Um, but it will help if you have all of those other things going for you. Um, and then, of course, meditation and mindfulness. 
it's a bit hard to get into flow if you've got things on your mind, um, if you're finding it very difficult to focus um, on the task at hand and instead your, your, your brain's constantly switching um, to some other stream of consciousness, then meditating for five or 10 minutes or doing some form of deep breathing for five or 10 minutes can definitely help calm the mind so that you can focus on the task at hand. Um, now, there are a number of flow state busters, and, and we'll touch on these in greater detail in subsequent episodes in this series. But you know, not having any sense of passion for your work, not really understanding the meaning or the purpose behind it, not having any clear goals or outcomes, checking your email too often throughout the day, checking your phone too often throughout the day, having notifications pop up on your screen, working in an open plan office where you're prone to not only interruptions, but just noticing a lot of activity around you, which can take you out of flow. Uh, there are so many things that take us out of flow. And I think you will know your, yourself what takes you out of flow, like how, what your personal habits are like when you're at your desk. Are you feeling anxious? Are you constantly, if working from home, walking to the refrigerator every 15 minutes in the cupboard to get a snack? Are you looking out the window? Are you going for uh, random walks around the house for no apparent reason? Are you just doing anything and everything to get away from actually just getting into the flow state? Because staying in flow can, getting into flow and staying in flow, if you're not used to it, it can be kind of difficult. Because you're essentially doing something that we have, especially over the last few years, trained ourselves not to do. And that is to just focus on one thing. You know, we've been training ourselves to check our phones every five minutes and to not sit with discomfort, to not sit with boredom. Um, but the more you can train yourself to just be totally immersed in one task the more great work you will do and the better you will feel at the end of the day. I mean, just yesterday I wrote a 3000 word article, it took me about four hours and I was just totally immersed in that. I did not do anything else that day work-wise, um, but I was buzzing for the rest of the day. Um, I just felt like I was operating at some higher, higher level of consciousness. I was just um, feeling great. And that is spending that time in flow. That's all it was. There wasn't anything Different I did that day compared to my usual days. It was really just having an amazing creative uh, experience and one that left me feeling great. Now, we will touch on this again in subsequent episodes um, a little bit further. But one thing you can do to train yourself to spend more time in flow is to just embrace boredom. Um, so the next time boredom strikes and you're sitting on your couch, like don't involuntarily reach for your phone or put on Netflix, or reach for a book, or whatever it is, but just try and sit there for 10, 15, 20 minutes, and just be alone, and present with yourself, and the more you can do that, the better you'll get at uh, tapping the flow state, and not being perennially distracted, um, and you can also practice this in various uh, places in your life, where other people won't even know, notice, for example, what we tend to do when we're at traffic lights in our cars or as pedestrians waiting to cross the road is we'll reach for our phones just to fill that 20, 30 second void. Just sit and be present in that moment. Um, you know, sitting, standing in the, the line at the grocery store, you'll typically, uh, well, I can't speak for you, but people typically reach for their phones. Um, so just tapping those small moments to just be present, to be comfortable not having to do anything um, not having to feed your mind with a short dopamine hit. Um, the more you can do that, the better you'll get at tapping into the flow state, the better you'll get at sitting with um, discomfort. So if you wanted to learn more about the flow state, I really recommend um, Stephen Kotler's book, The Rise of Superman. I mean, he looks at flow from the perspective of adventure sports, of extreme sports, um, and some of the... Triggers that I've talked through today uh, are inspired or taken uh, from his book in some way, shape, or form. And he's done some really great work in this space. I mean, he was a co-founder of the Flow Genome Project. Um, and if there's anyone who knows more than anyone else right now about Flow, except for perhaps Mihai it would have to be Stephen Kotler. And also Jamie Wheel to some degree as well. So check out Jamie Wheel. Um, I interviewed him 
in an episode of the Future Squared podcast. Um, so if you're wanting to learn more about the flow state after this episode, definitely check out that conversation. Um, and finally, measuring the flow state. Well, how do you go about measuring whether you're in flow? Well, there are headbands um, you can buy these days, such as the Muse and the Melon headband, um, which will actually track your brainwaves. Um, and therefore, you can use this to see how deep your meditation is, but you can also see this to see how much time you spend in flow at your desk. Now, if you were an authoritarian dictator type of manager, you'd get your entire team to wear these and monitor how they're performing and then say, hey, man, you went in flow for a half, for even one hour today. I'm only going to pay you for one hour. Of course, I'm only joking about that, but you could if you wanted to do that with your team just to see where people are at and use that as valuable feedback and say, hey, guys, um, based on the review we did last week, the team averaged two hours in flow. We'd love to get that up to four hours. Here are some things we can do to do that, um, such as, say, spend less time in email, less time on Slack, um, not communicating things that don't need to be communicated, using project management task boards like Asana or Trello to communicate instead of email, instant messenger and phone calls and Zoom. Um, and let's see if we can get that up to three hours in the next month and then maybe four hours because I know it's going to make you guys better at what you do. You're going to feel better. You're going to be more fulfilled at work and we're going to get closer to our goals as a team. So that's something to, to think about. And um, with that, I think I'm going to bring this episode of the Workflow podcast to a close. It's been an absolute pleasure to do this because it has been a few weeks since season two wrapped up, but we're back in lockdown here in Melbourne, Australia. And what better way to spend my time than to share what I have learned with the listeners of the Workflow podcast. Of course, as always, you can find more articles, podcasts, ebooks, and so on over at steveglovesky.com. Till next time, peace out.